Dr. Aldrich Chan, thank you for joining us here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's so great to see you. Thank you. Happy to be here. And lovely to see you again, Richard, here. How are you doing? You're, you're, you're in almost foreign lands from the, the West Coast. You're over on the East Coast now. That's right. I have to spread the word. What can I say? <laughs> no. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful stuff. Uh, now, Matt and I have just been talking about you, and uh, uh, we think you've actually done something really quite wonderful uh, with this this new book, besides uh, all the, 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 the work I'm sure your students and things are having a fabulous time with you, but reassembling models of reality. Mm -hmm. Let that go. I, I think the title says a lot of stuff. <laughs> but... What's going on there? What uh, what brought you to uh, to to write this book? Because it goes into a lot of spaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I'm the type of person that carries, I would say, a low grade of existential dread through life. And you know, there are moments where I have what I would say a non-clinical states of derealization, and. Um, when COVID struck, you know, it, it basically provided me with some time to focus on remedying some of the, the difficulties or challenges that I was having in the moment. And while I was looking through all the material that exists, I couldn't find anything that really integrated information from philosophy, neuroscience, and, and psychology. I found books, of course, that were very spiritually based or you know, uh, materialistic doctrines or, you know, and everything in between, but nothing that really put everything together. And it's especially in such a way that it can be applied in the clinical field. And I think that there is just, there's so much fascinating information and studies and, and movements that are going on right now that, you know, I, I decided to put the book together myself through various different, you know, research articles and, and philosophical um, writings and, and, of course, the whole host of books from interpersonal neurobiology. Now, this is this is a great service that uh, Richard and I have been doing as well, gathering all of these various you know aspects of research and thought and bringing them together in an integrative manner. Um, you know, for a, for a very practical um, uh, service, you know, to to psychotherapists, and that's what we've seen you do in this book, and it's it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. yeah, there's this strange, this is strange thing that that we seem to have done in science that uh, not many other people seem to do. I mean, I certainly agree with the idea of differentiating the elements and exploring their richness. But uh, sometimes Matt and I were talking, and I, I was saying it's it's like a mechanic uh, who pulls out a carburetor and and develops it and 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 you know makes it work better and you know increases the efficiency incredibly. Um, now. Pretty much every mechanic that I could imagine would then put that carburetor back in the engine. But we don't in science. We put a fence around it and we give it a name and we tell everybody to um, that it's got nothing to do with anything else. It's very strange. So this type of um, discussion of the, of the elements um, is surprisingly rare. So I'm really glad you've written the book. Uh, what sort of comments did you get from some of the, uh, the different I, you, I, mean, I could see in the in the early parts of it the different fields. What, what sort of comments did you get from those sorts of people in different areas? Well, I mean the the idea for for the book really is to target the individual as an individual truly is, which is not simply an object, and that's sort of what science does. It objectifies things, and everything within the lens of science, everything becomes an object. But then we be, then we're missing the subject. And the truth is that we're all multifaceted individuals and there are so many different um, angles which can, which can tackle the different dimensions of human experience. And, and so really each, each dimension of, of study really contributed to providing an, an, an integrated approach to really you know, treat an individual as a whole. It's, I think, oversimplistic to, to think that we can adhere to one specific approach and ignore everything else when treating someone who's 
who's you know suffering from let's say severe post-traumatic stress disorder, or actually anything, even a low-grade depression, you know, from the biological space all the way to the sociocultural and spiritual or existential, whatever word you want to use. Yes, and this is a um, a, a very uh, humbling um, book that you've written as well. Because I mean, it, it, it was it was humbling me because it brought back to my awareness just how limited our perceptions are. I mean, I, I know you're um, sort of the end game is to get us to explore, you know, more of what the client is experiencing, not from our own frame, but trying to understand their frame. Um, but coming back to a, a bit more of the, the foundational um, things that you discussed, our, our perception of the world and of reality is is extremely limited. And you've reminded us just how limited that is. You talk about, you know, the visual spectrum and how, you know, we only, we only see a little tiny bit of that and audio spectrum. And could, could you just expand a little bit on just how limited our perception is and um, then sort of extrapolating from that how possibly we shouldn't be so sure about what we're seeing and perceiving in front of us. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when it comes to the visual spectrum, um, we only see about 1%. And really, when it even comes to visible matter, it's less than 5%. Now, of course, you know, um, we, we assume there's dark matter and and that there's a lot more going on and forces that, that are beyond our understanding at this point in time. But the truth is that, you know, as human beings, we, we do really only sense and perceive um, a, a tiny, tiny fraction of what's happening. And that's not, and that's just the beginning because once the information becomes filtered through our sensory perception, it then becomes reinterpreted multiple times throughout our neural system. And Raquel estimated that 60 to 90% of the internal activity that's happening within our brains is actually uh, internally generated as opposed to the being you know, directly related to external stimuli. And of course, this then bridges us to what is going on within our brains, what is happening within these reinterpretive systems. Yeah, yeah, so our, our brain really fills in the gaps, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, that, and a great example of that is really the optic nerve, right? Which is a blind spot in both of our eyes. And, and you can easily see this with a little illusion by drawing a little dot in a piece of paper and, you know, um, positioning it in such a way that eventually you can see that uh, based on the whiteness of the paper, that little black dot just suddenly disappears because our brain is really projecting the most likely of circumstances onto the paper. Yes, I mean, that's a beautiful, uh, uh, elegant way of describing it, but uh, more fundamentally, uh, we make it up. We yeah. just invented that. Yeah. I, I did. There was a lovely story. I, I can't remember if it was Ramachandran or, or one of those guys, but talking about a chap who had an enlarged uh, uh, blind spot, a large um, uh, hole in the retina. So it was actually his uh, gap was about the size of a basketball. Wow. And uh, so, but he said, I could still wander around and and perceive the world quite successfully, he said, but it was really useful because if I was arguing with somebody and they were really starting to annoy me, I just adjusted my position so their head disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> <That's hilarious. laughs> and so, uh, so, so the brain uh, uh, does that aspect of, uh, it reminds me of, um, of uh, Lou Cozzolino's comments uh, about parenting and uh, various others in dance that, all we, what we have in our conscious awareness is a good enough awareness, a good enough knowledge of yeah. the of the space in order to survive. Uh, does that? What sort of thoughts does that prompt? And where, where in the book uh, those those aspects of? Uh, I mean, is it good enough to be what we are? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would say that you know our sensory perceptual systems, though very complex to us. You know, when it comes down to it, it's in, in in isolation. It's it's bound to make lots of mistakes, right? So so you know, one example I give in the book is the, the simple idea of you know looking at the stars above at nighttime, right? And uh, I used to play this joke on a friend of mine, and I would tell him, you know, listen, how much money would you give me if I could show you the past? And uh, you know, they'd be like, oh, I'll give you twenty bucks, right? 
and I'll take them outside at nighttime and I'll show them the sky and I'll say, well, there it is. There's the past, right? We would never have reached that conclusion if we were simply operating from a sensory perceptual, you know, mechanisms. So, you know, it does require very much the, the psychological, sociocultural, and, and again, the existential processes that are also composing who we are. Yeah, that's really interesting. So we, we really do build the picture of our existence and our existence within an existence through all these mechanisms. As I say, if you're just, if you're just out there doing it, um, what you see and feel, then it's one sort of thing. If you actually do these projections of these philosophical expansions, it's another sort of thing. Uh, and then if you do scientific investigation to try and peer uh, deeper than our sensory perception allows, then you get another perception. And all those things have been happening now for you know, five, 10,000 years uh, in various degrees. And we suddenly arrive at this thing. Um, and strangely, there's this idea that it should be perfect. But it seems to me from what you're saying in there that, you know, don't be surprised that, you, that you're having some, you know, mental, psychological or, or emotional issues. You're not that perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it, the, the illusion goes even further to, to many different domains, right? If we think about time, for instance, you know, it, we know it takes about, you know, two to 300 milliseconds for information to be registered into conscious awareness. And so everything is delayed by that amount of time. And then we consider the fact that the earth is moving, it's rotating at a very rapid pace, yet we feel as if we are still in this moment, right? And then we, we go deeper and then they tell us that, that, you know, when we look at atoms, it's, it's mainly, you know, 99% space in between, but I still see Matthew nodding his head, or I see, still see you, Richard. I don't see the space in between. And so, you know, really, I think evolution, and I'm in agreement with, with Don Hoffman's work, that you know, evolution has really carved out a brain that is, um, that, that is ultimately registering information based off of its fitness as opposed to its truth. Right, right, yes. And you know, I, I almost feel like stopping for a couple of minutes and letting that <laughs> sink in. It's fitness it rather than in. it's truth. That's beautiful, beautiful comment. And fortunately, a lot of um, these uh, illusions that our, our brain is uh, making up is common uh, amongst us, well, amongst most of us. And so we have this common um, experience of um, reality, quote unquote. Um, but there is also an awful lot um, which isn't common. Right. So um, I'm wondering if you can just uh, talk a little bit about um, now we're trying to make the connection between um, the, the therapist and, and a client um, where things maybe aren't common in perception of reality. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of these now we, we're transitioning now more into the we could say the, uh, the, the cognitive domains, which which would be the next mm. chapter. And, you know, what we come to are a series of different, you know, defenses and, and cognitive distortions that, that have been, and self-regulation mechanisms from, from gestalt that have helped us elucidate, you know, um, what sort of issues we may be, let's say, magnifying or, or polarizing or minimizing or whatever the case is. Um, we also find that when it comes to, to cognition, we also have a memory problem, right? Where false memories and, and eyewitness testimony, as is very well known, is, is a very, very low rate of, of accuracy and it's not very convincing, despite the confidence levels that some of these individuals may, may express. The confidence has absolutely no correlation with, with accuracy. And, and you know, that's where we run into some issues, right? When you're, when you're working with a patient who's, let's say, building their narrative off of uh, a, false, a false memory or, or a false belief. Um, to rewind just a little bit, the other thing that um, I think is important to mention, um, bridging the sensory perceptual back in, is that you know there are many studies now that also look at sensory perceptual um, changes and how that can alter our judgments in reality or, or obje objectively speaking. 
I think there was one study that was looking at people who were sitting on a hard chair and they were interviewing people. And they ended up finding that their judgments were, were harder than, than they would have been made if they were sitting on a soft chair. You know, there's so many of these little studies that are, that are so uh, that are potentially beneficial for us to be aware of so that, you know, the next time you're sitting with a patient, you know, are you feeling hungry in the moment or are you in pain? And how is that going to interfere with your, with your work? And what can you do to remedy it? Right. Uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, I, I do remember a study of um, judges. It's, I, I don't know if you've read this uh, study of judges, uh, you know, coming up to sort of lunchtime and they're very hungry um, and their judgments were um, sort of a bit more severe um, until after lunch. And mm -hmm. then they seem to be a bit, a bit less severe. So uh, again, you know, their judgment was um, uh, affected by their, um, you know, physical state. This, yeah, this self-awareness is something that, um, uh, we're discouraged in some fields and areas uh, where um, it's benign in others, and actually it, it's um, so, sort of uh, discouraged and, and held back, uh, uh, saying no, what you you know you're you're disconnected, you're objective. But I, I think the one where it's encouraged, and which I am so grateful that serendipitously that this is my life, is that I spent 20 years as an actor. Uh, where I spent a lot, there, there was a lot of need to perceive your your state because it certainly affected your performance on on mm -hmm. one night for the other. You know the the uh, uh, and and of course I saw many others. I had the the sort of interesting delight of talking to someone who did did enjoy a little tipple of of um, of the bottle of something, uh, and you could almost tell from her performance just how much she drank. Uh, it was it, it altered, you know, the way in which she presented not only herself, but the representation of herself in her, her acting character. So that was the, if anybody wants to uh, do that, go and go and <laughs> go to a, a live theater and go see four or five different performances. And you will see and, and if you could go back to the, the backstage and say, and, and how are you feeling tonight? Is it all? Oh, well, I, you know, I had pizza tonight and you know I had curry the night before and so on and so forth. So. These are, these are very strong elements, but I, I just want to, uh, uh, pardon me for sort of running on, I just had that thought, because we're going into these areas of consciousness and we're going to these states of mental things. And one of the things that everybody has uh, sort of universally had a particular pull draw out in, in the book and in your, your writings is your discussions of the default mode network. Mm. Uh, uh, now, you know, there are sort of three networks. John Arden's talked about this. Lou's talked about this. Dan's talked about this. Um, yours is really interesting. Could you just speak a little bit, you know, give give everyone a taste and get them so excited they have to go and buy the book? <laughs> so uh, I guess I should begin by explaining what the default mode network is. Yes, please. Um, so the default mode network is is known as your your resting state network. Now, it's, it's a bit of a paradoxical title because your brain's never actually resting, right? Um, but, you know, basically it's, it's involved with, with four core functions, with self-referential processing, um, social cognition, and your ability to mental time travel into the future to simulate a, a potential event or to retrieve an autobiographical memory. And so, you know, I've embedded it into the chapter of self because, of course, all of these functions are very much related to your sense of self. But what's curious about this is that it, it would be easy for someone to make the leap that the default mode network might be the seat of the self. But that just can't be true because of these other networks that it works in tandem with. So it works with another network called the salience network as well as um, the central executive network. And the salience network basically is the middleman that toggles back and forth between these states of the central executive network, which allows you to focus on a goal-directed task versus the default mode network, in which case here, again, an introspective uh, process, engage in introspective processes. Um, and so these, the central executive network and the default mode network, they're known as uh, anti-correlated in the sense that when the DMN is, is, is functioning, it ultimately sort of shuts down the central executive network. And when the central executive network is, is, is online, we have the default mode network turning off. 
And so it's not like we lose our sense of self as soon as we're engaged in a specific task. It may recede into the background, but you know, we're still very much there. So it, it, so the, the, the DMN, I'm just gonna start saying that because it's, it's easier. And so the DMN can't be considered the seat of the self, although it can be seen as a supportive process for the self processes. But what's interesting now is that we all have a sense of self that's continual. So where is that sense of self? It's, or what is the sense of self really? And so this is where I start delving into to Northoff's work. And he suggested that the sense of self may be um, attributed to the discontinuity actually of, of, of multiple networks working together in tandem. So then we have to think about a sort of, uh, so the discontinuity of neural activation corresponds to psychological continuity. That's, that's the, the way to put it. Um, and so we're thinking more here about a sort of gestalt happening, right? That the, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. But you know, really what it comes down to is when you break down these different processes of self, they too are subject to different illusions and, 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 and alterations because the DMN can change. And we know that from, um, well, on the positive side, we know that from mindfulness. For example, we know that practitioners who've been engaged in mindfulness practices for, for many, many years are, are, have a DMN that looks a little different. One study found the, that the, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is involved with, with multiple executive functions, comes online in their natural state. Now, on the flip side, we could look at PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, right, whereby we find a, a default mode network that seems to have regressed back to its earlier state. So the DMN doesn't stabilize until about nine to 12 years of age. And then um, basically between seven to nine years old, there's a big difference between the two. And people with PTSD, they seem to regress back to that earlier state of, of, of self-processing. Um, so, so yeah, that that's, uh, could be a nice intro to, to the DMN. Yeah, no, it, it's it's fabulous. This, the, I mean, Matt and I talk a lot in the frame of complex systems, uh, language, and and understanding. I'm pretty sure that's sort of in there. This, but this idea that we function uh, uh, with a series just emergent properties, that uh, emergent qualities, and the and the mind, the self, and so many of the things as as you discuss there. But, but because this leads straight on to another, you know, what, probably my favorite um, chapter heading is uh, I feel, therefore I am, mm. when you're talking on the emotions. So here's, here's another thing. So we've got this beautiful discussion there on the default mode network, and there's some great stuff there. You know, people need to go back and listen to that 10 times. <laughs> uh, but there's also this sense of that an emo- the, the, you talk about the relationship of the emotions to to uh, ourself. Uh, can you talk a bit about that aspect? Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a very big fan of Jack Pengsup's work, RIP, of course. Um, and, you know, ultimately, when you look at the studies that he's conducted, it, he really identifies the core of, 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 well, in their theory, the core of consciousness, right? And that the core of consciousness really is an affective core. And you know, he, you know, he identifies the, the seven primary process emotions and, and ultimately the theory behind this is that consciousness is intimately connected and related to, to affect. And in fact, when we think about the role of consciousness, um, and, and I have to identify Mark Psalms here in his work, it, it's that it's the importance of, of feeling out different experiences or feeling out different things that are, that are happening within and around us. And lots of times when there isn't, we, lots of times when we're conscious of something, it's because there's a problem of some sort. Otherwise, it doesn't need to be conscious. We don't need to consciously consider the different alternatives, right? And in, in which case, you know, um, in, in which case this, this highlights the importance of the unconscious really, or, or, or you could consider the non-conscious, whatever terminology you would like to use whereby, you know, if things are going well, you know, why, why, why spend all this energy and effort trying to fix it when there's nothing to fix? Whereas with consciousness, again, it's, it's about feeling out uh, an issue and then trying to resolve it in some form. Now, this aspect of uh, feeling a, uh, uh, an emotional distress or what we might call a, a mental illness or a, 
psychological disorder. How does in that you've already alluded to uh, to to the answers that I'm sure you're going to give, but when someone has that sense of uh, of disruption, which might be uh, to be feeling depressed or to be feeling anxious, or they might be having um, even you know sort of aspects of psychosis, delusional thoughts, but also these rapid movements. What uh, what sort of comments and, and frameworks do you put around that um, that experience that the person is having and, and and what they what they can do with it? Yeah. So you know this this now transitions into the way I view self processes really, in the sense that I, I guess I'll start by saying that with the idea that that the core of our sense of, of, consci- of consciousness is, is affective, everything surrounds or orbits this affective core. So all the cognitive processes, you know, and thoughts and experiences, they tend to agglomerate around. And this really brings up complexes from, from Jungian work. And, and I, I've always been a huge fan of, of Carl Jung, and it wasn't until Pankcep's work came out that it um, clicked so well for me that I, that I had to write about it, even though I know that certain people in the field are still you know, um, fearful of, of, you know, citing Jung for, for his ideas. But, you know, Jung himself actually in, 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 his, in one of his um, books cited the brainstem as a potential candidate for the emergence of consciousness. And of course, we find that the subcortical midline structures identified by Pankstep is, is, you know, theorized to be the, the, the core for the self. And when it comes to, you know, the theory of complexes, these are, you know, emotionally toned or emotionally charged sets of ideas that can occur at a, at a non-conscious level. And so if someone's experiencing severe levels of anxiety, let's say, we know that generally speaking, that there's, you know, high amounts of limbic activity. And, and, and by the way, the limbic activity has to do with the secondary process for Pankcep. And these are very unconscious aspects or, or unconscious processes that are happening. Um, so to go back, we have then, you know, these complexes that can form. So let's say someone, again, going back to the anxiety example, if someone has a huge, you know, fear of, of uh, has a lot of social anxiety, right? And they, they are unable to, to, to attend a, a specific event that's important to their friends. And they really want to go, but they're so fearful that something bad will happen or they'll say something and they'll make a mistake. You know, a part of it is really identifying the different emotions that the individual may express in session and sort of collapsing it down all the way to the, uh, the, the primary process emotions and, and helping them and facilitating the, the processing of these emotions so that these complexes that have all these, you know, thoughts and, and biases that agglomerated around them can disperse and we could improve integration within. Right, so we're breaking, we're breaking, we're breaking this complex down, and then sort of reassembling in a more, more healthy way. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm. Yeah. It, it, like, is it taking them back to the engine or to the to the mechanics, or, or so? Like the steering wheel's not steering well, uh, and it's not about holding the steering wheel more tightly. It's about going back to that that fundamental system, uh, as as Pankset, uh described. And do, is, is it something that you do with the client variously depending on the client? I mean, is it a psychoeducation uh, it, or is it a more practical aspects? Uh, how, do you, how do you then work with that um, retooling of the, of the system? Yeah. So, you know, I think that there are, are various methods. And um, as you know from the book, I, I, I'm not you know, completely married to any particular one. Yeah, we like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when it comes to processing emotions, you know, there, there are pretty clear studies indicating that if you, you know, let sleeping dogs lie or if you suppress them, it doesn't do the individual any good as it comes back. Or if you distract yourself, which lots of people love to do, eventually they come back or it'll emerge in some other form. And so, you know, one practice that I've always been very supportive of um, are mindfulness-based practices. Um, and specifically, you know, the, the idea of cognitive diffusion that comes from, from ACT, which is really, you know, building distance from the emotions that emotions and thoughts that you're having 
and being able to simply observe them as opposed to identify them. So it's the sort of idea that there's a difference between being angry and feeling angry, right? Whereas someone might be angry and punch a hole in the wall, someone else who's, let's say, engaged in this practice might be able to step back and, and view those emotions and experience them, but not act out. So instead of being reactive, they're responsive. Right, so developing the, the observing self. Right, absolutely. I, and this, I think this, 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 right. So this is what we would do as, as an actor. I mean, I, I always found it quite extraordinary we're talking about it, the value of knowing the time when I was acting a character who was incredibly angry, mm -hmm. but I was still uh, having some sense of uh, uh, not control so much, but I was able to be regulating that, but I was actually regulating the, the anger. So, mm -hmm. so it was, um, uh, uh, it's quite a fascinating thing, this observer operator quality, which we're kind of not educated much about, but uh, there's a lot that, that in your book allows us to see these, uh, these dual capacities of functioning. Mm. Yeah, I mean, as a therapist, that's what we, you know, have to do is if, if you've got a client uh, who's, you know, generating some anger within you, um, you know, especially if it's a, like a personality disorder that you're dealing with, um, you, you have to have that capacity of the, you know, the observer, right, to be able to um, recognize and, you know, maybe isolate those internal emotions that's going on inside of you to properly attend to the client that's in front of you. Yeah, and, and I think that this is a nice bridge to the idea that, you know, um, existential systems, or at least at least the way I work, you know, lots of times I think it's, well, I think it's important that there be a, a somewhat of a, of a hierarchy within someone's psychological disposition. And this is where the existential systems kind of come into play, um, seeing them as the, the center to which all these biopsychosocial processes, again, using the same analogy, tend to orbit. Um, and the development of, of the observing self is definitely a first step to, to doing so. Because, of course, someone who is who's observing their, their emotions and, and thoughts, you know, they may be able to relate to them differently. But I think that the limit of mindfulness, specifically for people who think of it as a cure, is that you can still have someone who has a mind full of, of maladaptive bias, emotions and thoughts and, and no good uh, resource to draw from, right? And, and this is where sort of traditional methods really of, you know, insight and, and pattern recognition within sessions and, and helping people, you know, build up a more um, objective uh, viewpoint of the world can be, can be really, really important. And now we've got this, had this wonderful background. I, I want to see if we can uh, just spend a moment returning back to the title. Uh, because I think it it actually has a lot of depth to it. Because we talked about uh, integration, and we talk about integrating a lot in uh, interpersonal neurobiology, but also in a lot of other uh, fields, and they talk about that. And I think this this word you've used at the beginning, reassembling, is is not the same as just integrating. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if if I'm picking up something or making up my own subtlety, but if you could speak to that particular, you know, that use of that word, it's really interesting. Hmm. Well, to be quite honest, I haven't thought of it that deeply, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, whoops, I did. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I mean, I can share with you my associations and the, tr the truth is that everyone already has their, their minds assembled in some fashion. And, and when it comes to reassembling it, we're really trying to, to, to terraform what's going on, which is why I, I you know, start the book with sensory perceptual, but then I even jump into to some of the metaphysical propositions and, and movements that are going on right now. You know, I'm, uh, for myself, um, I, I mentioned earlier on that there's some low grade of existential dread that I carry with me, right? Um, truth be told, you know, like, so my family, they never um, ascribed to any particular religion. My grandparents were Protestant, but they never passed anything down. My parents believe in very different things, and I never grew up with any sort of religion. Um, and, and basically, I was left to my own devices to develop my own sort of system of, of belief. And that was something that wasn't completely in place until, this, until, I wrote, uh, until I did the research and wrote this book and put it all together so I could come up with a coherent platform through which I'm operating. 
And even when we talk about all of the psychological techniques and, and so forth, there's there's no meta psychology that's that's really grounding our approaches. Um, and so, you know, it's it's just so fascinating that right now that we are at a time where materialism itself is being challenged on the basis of the hard problem of consciousness, right? Which which has to do with, you know, um, there there is a, a likeness to our experience and. Why aren't we just, you know, zombies that are operating, you know, on a, on a knee jerk basis when, when we can be. And so, um, of course, again, with, with all these different, uh, models that are coming up, it's, I think it's helpful for individuals to explore some of these options, especially if you're like me and you don't really, you know, you're not really with any religion, nor do you believe in anything, um, you know, concrete, it's, it's beneficial to, to, to really look at some of these and see what it is that resonates with you and, and not just what resonates with you, but also what makes sense with the information and um, what, with the science that exists out there. Yeah, absolutely. Beautifully integrating the science network. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I, I think it is very helpful to understand the um, very myopic view we do have of the world, the universe, everything, um, as, you, as you've outlined in your book. Um, and then, and to bring us back to reassess, well, um, what is it that I, I really believe? Mm -hmm. Ulrich, we, we're coming to near to the end of the um, podcast. So I'm just wondering, are there any uh, sort of sort of last words rounding out things that you'd like to um, tell our audience? Yeah, I mean, I would just suggest that, you know, everyone be, be, be open, very, very open minded to all the different approaches that are out there, because every every theory that has arisen comes out for a reason, you know, and it's they each represent some aspect of human nature. And I think it's it's overly simplistic and silly to disregard one approach over another. Mm. So, again, I think that, you know, integrating and, and of course, tailoring these approaches to, you know, whatever patient you have in front of you and collaboratively work with them and, and adjust as necessary is, is, is very important. Um, and when it comes again, uh, and I'll just a brief note on the, on the metaphysical portion of it all, I think that holding an agnostic stance when, whenever patients bring up, you know, different forms of religion or spirituality or, or culture is important. And your ability to kind of slide, you know, left and right between what, I, what I've mentioned in the book as the noumenal phenomenal axis can be very, um, can be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, I think we need uh, we need people to read this book and mm -hmm. and get you back sometime uh, a few months down the track because uh, there's there's we we've, we've scratched beautifully on the surface, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure there's a there's a there's a lot more uh, that people will will be able to appreciate once they've they've had a bit of a look through the book. So we yeah. really recommend they read it. Yeah, Richard, I'm feeling the same. I feel like we've we've just really skimmed across a, a sort of a really deep pool of 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 wisdom here. So would love, um, yeah, to come back and maybe pick one or two and go go a bit deeper. Yeah, that would it would be my pleasure. Thank you so much for for having me. Very nice to see you again, Richard, and very nice to meet you, Matt. Good to good to meet you too. We'll, we'll catch okay. you next time then. Okay. Okay. Bye for now. Bye.